<clears throat> Good evening. Uh, thank you uh, for joining me this evening. My name is Ken Rosenthal and I'm a park naturalist here at Gulf Branch Nature Center. Uh, although I'm not at Gulf Branch Nature Center, I guess I shouldn't say it quite that way. Uh, we are going to talk about hibernation this evening. Uh, just a reminder, uh, it is being recorded and I um, do prefer to get questions when you have them. Um, you can put them in the chat. I'm not checking the chat while I'm talking uh, so I can get to the chat at the end if you're if it's not urgent. Um, but if you have a question that's for the moment and it makes sense to ask me, then please do that. Um, I'd prefer to answer it when you have the question because sometimes it's it's more impactful and it's, it's a better answer for from me and for you uh, at that time. Uh, but generally, if um, if you're not asking me a question, please be sure to keep your mic off and your camera off as I run through the program. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and share uh, my screen and we are going to get started. Someone would just take a second to. There we go on Mike and let me know that you are seeing what I'm putting up there. That would be fantastic. Hopefully everybody's seeing the title screen there. OK, well, I'm going to go. No volunteers to yell at me that we're doing good, so we'll just make sure we're all set here. <clears throat> so we're going to talk about hibernation. Uh, I love this topic and like talking about this topic. Uh, it, some of you may have heard me say at some point how I enjoy um, sharing with people the difference between poison and poisonous and venomous because to me it's a very important distinction and it's important to get that correct. I I, I think the the proper usage of words is really really important. And another one that gets thrown around a lot as if it's interchangeable with other things is hibernation. Um, again, poison is not venom. Venom is not poison. That's a different delivery method. Hibernation is the same thing. Different groups of animals have different types of inactivity that's important, but it is not hibernation. And so that's what we're going to talk about a little bit tonight and get into, and, and hopefully I can show you a few critters from other places that um, have some interesting stories as well. Um, so we know it's getting cold. It's not this cold yet, but we definitely had a, a, a turn for the colder. Uh, here in the past few days and these are the kind of conditions where you, I think most people can tell just by looking at that um, there's not gonna be a lot of plant material to eat the oops, someone can go ahead and turn their uh, microphone off there thank you um, there is um, snow covering the ground so any of the any of the food on the ground is going to be more difficult to find you know if the ground is uh, frozen that you know everything there is frozen but it, it probably wasn't frozen but when the ground gets frozen that can also be a, a barrier to finding food uh, and then certainly certain things simply can't live in that cold so if you eat those things you're also in big trouble when it comes to food sources so what's the problem uh it's cold i think that's that's an understatement here um but there's really a couple of underlying factors that make the cold the problem for certain critters um your tissues can freeze if you don't have a, a, a layer uh, that can protect you um we don't have a lot of animals around here that have blubber but certainly have many animals that have fur and have uh feathers and those are certainly um things that can protect you protect your tissues from freezing um for a lot of critters they have a depressed metabolism because it gets cold and it makes the, I mean, their metabolism run slower and that can also be a problem and as i mentioned on the previous uh, couple you know two slides ago um for a lot of them there's just not a lot of food and that can be a real problem now there's a number of, of ways you can address this we're going to talk about the groups uh the animals that tend to go inactive okay this is not one of those animals we know that um Canada geese may fly south. Sometimes we still see them around in the winter. They tend to like um, plant material, certainly grass and things that are on the ground. When there's a layer of snow and ice, it can inhibit them finding the food that they're they're typically used to. But they have other adaptations that can help them out. You've all seen gulls, you've seen geese, ducks, you know, standing on the snow, standing on the ice. They're able to do that because they have a countercurrent circulatory system in their feet. You know, as the as the warm uh, blood comes in through the artery into their feet. It is right next to the vein that's returning um, from returning blood that has just traveled through uh, the circulatory vessels in the foot. And what happens is that every step along the way here where the two vessels are connect or right next to each other, there is a heat transfer. And at every area along here, the blood coming up in the vein is always colder to some degree 
uh, then our blood coming out from the artery. So at every step along the way, that blood is being warmed so that when it returns to the body, there's very little heat loss. It's very efficient. But not all critters have this. Um, and certainly, even if you do have this, it doesn't matter if you don't have the right kind of food out there to eat. OK, there's a lot of activity that goes on in winter. There's a lot of critters that, that do that sort of thing, but there's a lot that don't. And that's who we're going to talk about. Um, it can mean winter can mean changing your food supply. Uh, you can see on the right here, we've got a fox. Uh, it's very gracefully um, went after a, a rodent that's running under the uh, the uh, snow there. On the left, there's another small mammal that probably met its end uh, at the hands of a predatory bird, which could be a hawk or an owl. Um, and while all this is going on, there's several, uh, there's many, many other animals that are in a state of dormancy. And the dormancy is an inactive period in the life of an animal or plant during which growth normally slows or completely ceases. Uh, the physiological changes associated with dormancy help the organism survive adverse environmental conditions. And that's important to remember is that last few words there, survive adverse environmental conditions. It doesn't always mean winter and it doesn't always mean cold. Um, and that's why it's important to make sure you're using the, the proper terminology um, when we talk about these different kinds of um, different types of, of dormancy. The one key, another key here is that you are minimize, minimizing, minimizing metabolic activity in order to conserve energy. Um, and, you know, it, it's um, I, I'm doing a program. My, my deep dive next month is on wintertime economics. And what's important about that uh, and, and the reason I talk about that is it's really a balancing activity. You're trying to um, not spend so much, even though you have to spend some energy in order to conserve heat. Um, in this case, you know, when we talk about hibernation, we talk about these different types of other different types of dormancy. You're minimizing metabolic activity either because you have to or because your food's run out. Uh, you have to because co conditions are becoming um adverse that even if you had the right kind of food you couldn't survive in that weather you know and, and so for some reason you've had to go dormant you've had to stop what you were doing you've had to essentially take a pause if you will uh, for a certain period of time and that helps you conserve energy and also uh survive those conditions that are not um the best for you okay so there's predictive dormancy uh, which is getting ahead of it versus consequential dormancy. Predictive dormancy um, could very much be thing, you know, something like hibernation where you go in well ahead of the conditions that um, would make you have to hibernate. So you're getting ahead of it. And a lot of times things, the cues for something like that are uh, photo period. OK, whereas consequential, consequential dormancy might be reacting to weather cues and oh, it's cold today. It's going to be cold for a while and I'm going to be dormant until this cold weather ends or at least it gets a little warmer where I can be active again. Um, so that's the difference between the two. Uh, we're going to start with torpor. We'll get to hibernation, I promise. We're going to start with torpor. A state of adaptive hypothermia used by endotherms in order to save energy. OK, um, I think we've all seen or hope I, I would like I would like to think most of us have all experienced the. Um, uh, the puffed up bird that you see out in the winter, you know, a lot of birds migrate. That's a story for uh, another program or for a program two months ago. Um, but a lot of birds migrate because they lose their food source. Other birds that stay around might switch their food source or whatever that case may be. Um, certainly, you know, this guy is standing on the snow and obviously has some adaptations like that countercurrent blood flow to help uh, reduce the loss of heat through the legs. Um, but also you can see it's really puffed up. I always um, tell people that I know how cold a morning is if I walk out and the birds all look like little puff balls because they fluffed out their feathers. And as those feathers fluff out, they trap warm air against the bird's body, and so they maximize the amount of warm air they have around them. Excuse me. Um, so when we, you know, when birds do this, it's definitely cold, and they're, and they're reacting to that. They can also, um, you know, lower themselves down, uh, and and if they're perched or if they're sitting or if they're inactive, and cover their feet with their feathers as well to help also insulate their feet. Um, but this is a, uh, you know, a, a reaction to that cold weather and you will see a lot of different birds like that. But even 
for some birds, it, it can be a bigger problem at certain times of the day than not. Uh, this is a black capped chickadee. This is not the chickadee we have around here. Uh, when I first moved here, oh my gosh, 12 years ago, it took me, I think, five or six months to realize that the chickadees I was seeing were not black cap because I grew up north of here and then those are the chickadees we had coming to our feeders and that's what I was used to seeing. Well, we have our Carolina chickadees, very similar birds. Um, they're separated, you know, it's very visually, I, it's kind of difficult to see the difference between them. Um, I know what they are and I still don't know if I could tell it in the field uh, very well. I don't know if I would know to even look at it, especially around here. I'm sure we see them occasionally, um, but pretty much I think the, the Pennsylvania, Maryland, border is is roughly similar to the area where you stop seeing Carolina chickadees and you start seeing black cap chickadees. Um, I spend holidays in Massachusetts. It's black cap chickadees. Come back to Virginia. It's Carolina chickadees, but they're very similar. And, and there's an interesting um, study and understanding of what black cap chickadees do, you know, um, and something to remember, too, is with all those feathers, you still have the eye and you still have the beak and those are two places where there can be a lot of heat loss where they don't have quite the same adaptations as the um as the leg so so that is still a spot where you can lose some heat even with all the insulation all those feathers um, but what's really interesting about um these birds is they essentially turn the lights out at night you know they might go to sleep they go roost wherever they're going to be at nighttime and in the p.m at the end of their day their body fat's at seven percent and in the morning, their body fat's at 3%. That's a tremendous loss. Even for a small bird like that, that's a lot of, of loss. And that is being used by their, their metabolism to help keep them warm overnight. Because whatever the temperature is during the day, it's always going to be colder at night. That's almost always the case. And, and that can be a really tough uh, way to get through the night. Um, they can't add in food. They can't go hunting. They don't. They are not nocturnal. So uh, foraging, not hunting, but foraging. Um, so they're not going to eat a lot of food overnight. So just like if you have times where your income is lean, where money coming in is lean, and you want to spend less, chickadees do the same thing. Overnight, they may drop their body temperature by as much as 12 degrees. Okay, that certainly sounds like um it's very similar to what we would consider hibernation because that is a tremendous uh, temperature loss for the birds um but it's not a very long time it's just overnight so i don't think in other ways it would qualify but essentially you know their body their metabolism drops <coughs> excuse me their metabolism slows and drops and they're able to maintain a lower body lower body temperature without too many adverse effects. They're still losing body fat, but imagine what that 7% would be in the morning if they weren't able to drop 12 degrees overnight. And the nights are longer. So we're not just talking, um, you know, a 12 hour night or an eight hour night, like, you know, when it's, when it's uh, light until eight o'clock or so in the summer and it, by six o'clock it's light again, which might only be nine or 10 hours overnight. Um, now we're talking, if it's almost dark by five o'clock and it's dark until six, you know, you could be talking 12, 13 hours. I should have done the math, I didn't, but it's a much longer time. It's a tremendous amount of time. It's more than half their day that they are no longer bringing in food to have energy. Um, and so that's a tremendously long time to do that. And what they're able to do again is they can drop their body temperature so that they are able to survive the night because they're essentially, it's another way to think of it is you're turning down your thermostat so you don't spend as much heating over and then you got blankets or other things to keep you warm. And they're just lowering their body temperature so their body doesn't have to work as hard to maintain this higher temperature overnight. So, um, uh, the star of the show is uh, is hibernation. It is really a common word. Uh, I think most people understand it as a word um, that means you're going to sleep through the winter and you're going to avoid all the bad things of winter. I think it's often looks. I you know in my in an email I sent out to the the master naturals list served to um, let people know my program. I said you know I'm sure a lot of people have a very um, romantic thought about hey if i could just go to sleep in november and sleep through to march that would be great uh miss the, the 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 winter season i i really enjoy winter i would hate to hibernate but um it's actually a, a tremendous advantage for certain animals that simply can't go somewhere else they can't migrate um and the food that they eat which is um is, is simply something that they're not going to find in the winter um there are places where there is a lot of snow 
Uh, this is my sister at uh, Rocky Mountain National Park uh, in Colorado. This is, by the way, I think uh, th to explain the short uh, as I think this was uh, June, might even be mid or late June. So you still you still see a lot of the snow up in the mountains, up in these high altitudes, but they've got the roads cleared so you can get through. Hopefully, uh, sometimes it doesn't happen until well after uh, Memorial Day. Um, but you know up in these climbs you'll have animals like the american pika on the left and the yellow-bellied marmot on the right you know these are rocky mountain species they may only have four eh, if they're lucky maybe five months above ground months out of hibernation and that is a law as a pretty short time to prepare for sometimes you know, if they, if you figure they only have four months that means eight months they're underground it's only four months to prepare for twice that amount of time being underground and, and being a hibernator and, and not eating uh, and sleeping. So that's tremendous. So, you know, what goes for hibernation around here um, is pretty, I don't want to say small potatoes because it's still, it's still a struggle if, if you have, whether you have to do it, but at lower latitudes, uh, you know, or at lower elevations, it may not be something that's needed as long. So you'll have animals that hibernate at these different in different places where the animals in one area may not hibernate nearly as long as the same species in another area where the winters are longer and colder for example uh, here's the woodchuck or you might know it as a groundhog chuck woodchuck ground pig whistle pig whistler thick wood badger canada marmot monax moonak weenas wed monk you know there's a lot of names you can just call it whatever you'd like i gotta say i i would i'm pretty fond of whistle pig um, although I never remember because I was like, there's a woodchuck, and it's as I say first, or groundhog. Um, but they have a lot of different names. This is uh, an eastern species. They are a marmot. Uh, they're one of the largest uh, species of squirrels in the squirrel family. Um, and they are actually really good climbers as well as obviously very good at, at digging. Um, they will make a pretty elaborate... Oops. Stop it. They'll make a pretty elaborate... Um, uh den where they will hide they often have a plunge hole which is um kind of hidden a little bit away from the main entrance so that they have a a second way because if a predator could get between them and the main entrance they still have another way to enter their den uh and get to safety quite frankly i you know and i'm sure there's big predators that can go after woodchucks if you ever see woodchucks have the same kind of teeth that rats and mice do they're rodents those are some pretty scary teeth uh, no matter what size of, of a predator you are. Uh, but you can see this is pretty complex. There's a plunge hole, there's a main entrance, you got a sleeping chamber, you've got a nursery chamber, there's a turnaround, a spot to turn around, there's a waste chamber, there's a lot that goes into this. If you're a skunk, you ding an entrance and a hole and a chamber, that's it. Um, so I always like to tell people that some, I think sometimes skunks are really excited that they can find an abandoned woodchuck hole because they're not going to put the effort into that, but they'll happily move into a, a much bigger place to live. And here's a slightly less cartoony version of it. And you can see there's two entrances. It might be an additional chamber, but there's a a, um, a sleeping chamber here. And oftentimes they will have two dens. They have their winter den, and then they have their their summer den, their den where they're active throughout the uh, throughout the summer season. Okay, let's take a second to talk about chemistry. I know I know you're all excited, and so am I. Um, when water freezes, it forms a tridimite, hope I remember that name right, um, structure. And what I want you to notice here is forget about all the molecules. Look at the look at the dark black lines. They're pointy at the end. When things freeze, when water freezes, uh, I, hopefully we've all had that experience, it forms crystals. It looks really pretty on the glass that's keeping you warm on one side while there's ice and cold on the other. That's not really pretty if it happens in your tissues or if it happens in your blood. Freezing tissues because of this for this crystalline formation that ice has can rupture, can tear, can can be really damaged by being frozen. That's why, you know, frostbite and other conditions like that can be really, really bad news, especially if that's uh, the type of exposure you have over a long period of time. It can lead to tissue damage. It can lead to loss of extremities. Um, it can be really, really bad news. So that's what all these animals are trying to avoid. Uh, in the case of the woodchuck, their second burrow or their winter burrow, maybe as deep as six feet underground, you're trying to make sure that you dig your sleeping chamber far enough underground 
that even if the ground freezes, you're not going to. Around here, I think that's really highly unlikely, and it's possible that our woodchucks don't dig nearly that deep. But the further north you go, if you go up into Pennsylvania, New York, you even go up into New England, those burrows have to be deeper because some of those areas may have periods where the ground freezes and you don't want to be too close to the surface if it's really going to get that cold. Um, you can see that they sleep three to six months. That, again, is dependent on where you are. A woodchuck around here might only have to sleep a couple of months, two, three. Up north, it might have to go six before they're going to be able to come out and find the food they need. Um, their body temperature drops from, you know, 40 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit from 96 to 47. That's one of the keys of hibernation it is a significant temperature drop in an animal that does not normally experience that temperature drop. So if you have, you know, you can see these temperature drops in ectotherms all the time. Ectotherms are uh, cold-blooded animals, uh, reptiles, amphibians, fish, where they, you know, they have these temperature swings from in the morning to the, till they warm up and then back to cooling down overnight again. That's their, that's the way their body works. For warm-blooded animals, their body works to maintain uh, a relatively stable temperature. Um, they have to eat more rat more frequently than ectotherms. Um, and then they also often have things like they have fur or feathers. Those are, are two endothermic animals. Groups of animals are mammals and are birds. Um, and so they need to have uh, energy to keep that furnace going, keep that internal temperature. And then they also tip, tend to have a body covering that really keeps that heat in and protects that heat from leaving in the winter, um, but might help um, them, you know, siphon some of it off in the summer so they don't get too hot. Um, so that body temperature drop in an animal that doesn't normally have that, that's really the key for hibernation. The other thing that's fascinating, their heart rate slows from 100 beats a minute to 15. So that's almost, not quite, that's probably more than one and a half beats per second to one beat every three, uh, every four seconds. Um, so that's a tremendous slowdown in the heart rate, and that means their metabolism slows down as well. Um, they lose 20 to 30 percent of their body weight over winter. I don't want to make a joke about diets, but if I could be completely inactive over the entire winter and lose 30 percent of my body weight, I'd think about it. It's probably not healthy, but I think about it. Um, but they do come out looking very thin. <clears throat> when I worked in um, Cleveland at one of the nature centers there a long time ago, we had a woodchuck mount that we used for our program, especially our, our, our groundhog day programs in February. And you could tell that that groundhog had a very thin coat and it was also a pretty skinny groundhog. And he had probably just come out uh, that spring and that's when he had died. I believe that um, the groundhog got hit by a car and that's how we ended up with it and we were able to mount it. And it was a really good mount. Um, but they lose, you know, a significant chunk of their weight from one fifth to over one third of their body weight over the winter. That is, again, dependent on how long they sleep uh, and also how well prepared they were, how much um, fat they put on uh, ahead of the, the time that they went into the um, into their burrow. Uh, we have a lot of bats in Virginia. Uh, this list is not the list of all the bats in Virginia, but these are the bats that tend to hibernate here. Um, that they still will move. They still might move in a short migration. A lot of bats, a lot of bats have a summer home and a winter home. Uh, so they often have a summer cave, or the, which in some species might even be called their bachelor cave, uh, and then they have a winter cave where it, it tends to be a little more insulated, a little more protective from cold temperatures. Doesn't mean it's not cold. It just might be. Uh, less severe in the temperature changes. Remember, you're you're um, in the air. You can have wild swings in temperature. You know, around here we've even had days that probably at one point were 70 degrees, and by the end of the, you know, the overnight they dropped into 30. Um, a 30 point swing is pretty tremendous, but that's something you don't typically see like in aquatic environments. Um, and so being underground in in a cave or in a sheltered area like that can probably also minimize the effect of those. Uh, surface temperature swings uh, above ground. Um, and again, uh, a lot, some of these um, may or may not uh, still be in our area, but they do tend to hibernate here in Virginia, so they might move short distance away. There's also, um, oh, blank, and I think it's the long-eared bat, which is our state bat, uh, the eastern red bat, and there's another one I can't think of. I 
silver bat that um, migrate out of the area in order to, um, I think, still hibernate. They still hibernate. These are all bug eaters. You know, our bats around here are all bug eaters. There's no bugs uh, in the winter. There's no real food for them. And so that becomes that's the issue that they have to uh, address when they go into or the reason they go into hibernation. Um, Another thought about this is, you know, uh, take a look here. I want to make sure I remember to say this with the last one. Uh, their body temperature drops to near air temperatures. Their heartbeat and respiration slow. OK, so they have a significant drop in, in body temperature. Their heartbeat and respiration slow down a lot. They will move within the cave it, if they need to find an area that has the optimum temperature. Uh, it also doesn't hurt if you've got all your buddies doing this as well. Um, they may roost with other species, so you, it may not be just uh, one species of bat, you might have two, three, four that are all roosting together. Um, flying squirrels do the same thing in the winter. They're active throughout the winter, but they're a lot less territorial and a lot happier to uh, snuggle with their buddies from around the area during the winter if it helps keep them warm. Um, when it gets cold out, a lot of animals lose a lot of their territoriality uh, in order to help them stay warm. Um, and they awaken readily and can fly within minutes. This is of concern for two reasons. One, uh, you want to keep people out of bat caves in the middle of the winter because if they go in, they can disturb the bats, which can cause them to fly, and then they lose, uh, they use up their energy quicker. Remember, I talked earlier about the economics of winter, like the the, the budget, if you will. Um, a alert bat and a moving around bat is going to plow through some of its winter reserves quicker. Than it would if it continues to to sleep with a low heartbeat and low respiration, but they can't awaken readily, and so that's um, bad news for them if people go in and disturb them. It's also bad news um, if they get white nose syndrome, which has um, been quite a problem in bat uh, populations over the last several years, um, because what often happens is they get that fungus, and that fungus doesn't uh, affects their body in such a way that it causes them to continue to use their reserves at a faster rate than they should. And they wake up early and they emerge from the. Uh, the cave of their roost and there's no food and they end up dying. Um, we can certainly prevent people from bothering the bats and waking them up. That's something that, that we can take care of. Uh, but that white nose syndrome is, is, is a much bigger problem for these bats as well. Um, but they do wake in readily and can fly within minutes. Um, and this is. I think what people used to think was the poster child for hibernation as they make American black bear, but they're not a true hibernator. Um, their body temperature just drops slightly. Six degrees is still six degrees. You know, if you had, if your temperature bumped up six degrees, you'd be in the emergency room because going from an average of 98 to something that's around 104 is really, really bad news. That's a horrible, you know, fever spike. Um, dropping six degrees, probably not uh really a good idea either okay um but it's not as massive a uh, temperature drop as something like the woodchuck or some other rodents that that are true hibernators uh, they don't eat drink defecate or urinate um while they are uh in a what is essentially torpor i guess we have to call them that even if they're not uh true hibernating uh, it certainly seems like they're hibernating they don't eat they don't drink they don't defecate or, or urinate so their body has several different um uh, chemical processes that that take care of that because the whole point of getting rid of um, waste is because leaving it in the body is not a really good idea. Uh, it doesn't it doesn't need to be there. It can't be used. And in some cases, having it accumulate in your tissues can be really really bad. Um, and so they are there are some chemical processes that happen in the bear's body that don't happen the rest of the year, but happen while they're hibernating to. Um, lessen the effect of the, um, the accumulation of these chemicals from either that would all otherwise be passed relatively quickly um, that would be you know defecated or urinated and so they have things going on in their body that's really really important to take care of that their heart rate does slow from 40 beats per minute to eight beats per minute you know, that's 20 that's an 80 percent decrease you know from a, a heartbeat um uh, four to six every you know you got one you got four beats every um six seconds to uh one heartbeat every oh, i had the math on this and i forgot it, one beat heartbeat every like seven seconds 
you know, so it's a tremendous drop. And and this is, I think, where some people where some people would consider hibernation, even though it's such a small temperature drop. They also, similar to the groundhog, lose a quarter to a third of their body weight over winter. OK, but they do waken readily. And I think this might be one of the differences from a, a true hibernator. So, you know, don't go messing around hibernating bears. It's, it's really, really bad news. Uh, brown bears um, do hibernate, I believe. Uh, certainly they're up in areas, you know, further north than black bears um, where the the winter does get worse. Um, here you see some bears who are paying attention to, I don't know what, might have just been taking a swim, um, but the brown bears are really famous for um, fishing, uh, you know, and working the salmon runs right before um, it's time to go in and be dormant for the winter. Um, I know I have a coworker who is absolutely loves Fat Bear Week uh, when they have the bear cams on the rivers up in Alaska and you'll see the bears come in and they're kind of skinny and, and then, you know, a week or two later from just gorging on fish, they're super fat. Let me go back here for a minute. To prepare for um, this period of inactivity, black bears go through a, t a period called hyperphagy. Um, and that is they they eat a lot and it usually starts, you know, mid to late mid yeah, like mid to late July, where something their body kicks in and says, okay, you got to eat a whole lot more. Um, if you remember, I mentioned that, um, you know, bats don't mind roosting with others. Um, flying squirrels tend to lose that territoriality if it means snuggling with a bunch of buddies to stay warm in the winter. For bears, they lose some of that territoriality during this period of time because it's more important to stuff the food in your gut than it is to be upset that another bear is in, is near you also eating in what you may have considered your territory. Um, so they become a little more tolerant of each other or just more preoccupied with finding food. For a bear, hyperphagy can mean you know, trying to ingest upwards of 20,000 calories a day. Um, you know, the, I think the they always talk about the typical, you know, human intake for a day that's, you know, a healthy amount or at least a basis to start with is like 2,200 depend calories, I think, depending on your, your level of activity. So bears are trying to eat 10 times at a day and they don't have pizza and that's the problem. Uh, when I used to teach this in Colorado, I had 10 uh, large pizza boxes. And I would tell the kids, these are 10 large pepperoni pizzas is about the equivalent of 20,000 calories a day. I can't imagine trying to ingest those amount of calories a day. I would be game to go after about 10 pepperoni pizzas in a day. You know, I'd give it a whirl once to see. I feel like I wouldn't enjoy it. Certainly couldn't turn around and try to repeat it the next day and the day after that. And then bears don't have that kind of food. They don't have this rich and lush food that we have where it's really easy to put on the calories. They're trying to put on 20,000 calories a day with ants and termites and slugs and, um, you know, berries and, and uh, fruits. And and again, not the not even the, you know, when you consider some of the fruits that we get and how they've been genetically modified um, over time, just from crossbreeding and all these things to to what they are now, where you don't find uh, many of the fruits as we know them in the wild. Um, you know, if bears are eating cherries, they're eating things like choke cherries, where most of that fruit is actually that pit, and there's just a, a small layer of, of fruit around it. They're not the, the 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 lush cherries that we have. So they're eating a lot trying to bring in a lot of calories on food that's not nearly as calorie rich or as energy dense as is what we're used to they could really use some protein bars um so that's something to consider as well oh and, and again that sense of smell that bears have is what gets them in trouble especially you know mid to late summer when they're trying to find that much more food they key on things because their sense of smell is so good you know, that's how they find bugs and ants and different things under all these uh, rocks and crevices and logs. That's how they can locate um, fruit. But that's how they also smell food from campers. That's how they smell trash. And so that's how they can also uh, end up getting themselves in trouble while they're trying to prepare for winter. Um, what about chipmunks? Uh, as I prepare for these programs, sometimes I get myself caught in a little rabbit hole that I wasn't paying attention to. Um, I remember looking up chipmunks to just make sure I had the right info and then I realized why I didn't put chipmunks in this presentation when I did it several years ago, um, but I felt like I should bring it up now. Depending on what you read online, um, and I have a couple books I'm going to go to that I didn't have access to today, but I'm going to try to do my homework over the next day or two on this. Um, 
depending on what you read online, either chipmunks are not true hibernators or eastern chipmunks hibernate, but the western species don't. Um, and so it's it's an interesting idea because if you've ever watched a chipmunk just like this guy right here, they're constantly stuffing their face. Chipmunks have cheek pouches that they can store food in. They'll pick up seeds and nuts and they'll chew off the sharp ends and then just you know, put them into their cheeks and they get back to their den and they just you know, squeeze them out with the, the heels of their front paws and they just put all these out because they're in their cheek pouches. I think ideally they're not covered with saliva. Um, well, chipmunks are constantly looking for this food, running back and forth. Uh, my first naturalist job at a nature center in Ohio, I was just fascinated with this one chipmunk because his, we would spread some seed out for the chipmunks and the squirrels to keep them, try to keep them off the bird feeders. But this one chipmunk, that was his territory. And he just spent the whole time chasing the other chipmunks instead of, and he probably spent more time worrying about the other chipmunks than actually getting in food where he probably got less than those other chipmunks. Um, it was not a good uh, cost benefit ratio for that behavior. Um, but, you know, people often talk about how uh, you can often read about how that territoriality is something that really defines the, the chipmunk as a species. You, you'll see that it's a very strong territoriality, uh, and except for a very brief period where they um, are mating, you know, where they're breeding, um, they don't tend to really tolerate each other very much at all. Uh, and so, again, I remember I used to tell people all the time, yeah, the chipmunks gather up their nuts and then they make this little bed and they make uh, they make this little um, midden with all their nuts and then they make a little bed on it and that's where they sleep and they close up the holes. And, and I'm not sure about that because I also I, I read where they are and aren't hibernators. And, and the last thing I read, which seemed um, more interesting, is that they may not hibernate fully through the winter, but they have small periods of hibernation, whereas the western chipmunk species don't hibernate, but they do go through torpor during the cold winter months. Um, these are least chipmunks. I have several pictures of uh, Western chipmunks, and this is the only one that I actually got somebody uh, confirmed my identification. They all look very similar. That can be very hard. You can see that they have, uh, they're a little more stripy on the face than the Eastern chipmunk. I think they tend to be a little smaller uh, than our Eastern chipmunk, but you also notice that uh, if you're looking at the scientific name, the eastern chipmunk is the only species in the uh, Tamias genus. I hope I'm saying it right. Whereas the Neotamias genus uh, of the western chipmunks has many species, and I don't know if, if uh, you know, if there's enough of a difference between them that that's why the eastern might hibernate versus the westerns not hibernating. Anyways, uh, I found that really interesting. It ended up being a real a rabbit hole for me of reading other things uh, when I was getting ready for this this program. So. Um, my plan is to see if I can find a more definitive answer. And then uh, when I send you all a link to the recording, uh, I might include a little note about that and follow up so I can do my homework. Uh, but I thought that was really interesting that, you know, ours, the Eastern species might, um, does hibernate and the Western species don't. I thought that was a, an interesting uh, idea between them. There was a time when we thought, uh, I love telling this story, so if some of you already heard it, I apologize, but there was a time when people thought that birds hibernated, that birds like swallows and swifts would hibernate uh, in the muck underneath uh, ponds, and they would come out in the spring when the bugs came out so they could start flying and, and hunting them again because we didn't understand that birds migrated. So birds like um, barn swallows or house swallows were, were thought to be that. Um, we do know now that there's at least one species of bird uh, this is one in North America that hibernates or at least goes through, I shouldn't say hibernate, but goes through torpor uh, during the cold winter months. This is the common poor will. This is its um, range, and you can see it's a Western species. We don't have them around here. They have a summer breeding range and a year-round range. So the birds, the northernmost birds um, typically migrate, but they all come back into that southern range. The birds that are already in that southern range may not um, migrate a little or at all. But they can during the winter go through an, an extended period of torpor, which could be weeks to months. Um, but they also do waken readily if disturbed. You know, another bird that just let them sleep, let them let it, you know, have its winter nap. Don't bother it. But they're also so cryptically colored. I think that uh, you, you know, especially if they're in torpor, it would be hard for you to to notice them. Um, so there is at least one bird that goes through a. Uh, a type of dormancy, a type of torpor, although it's not really a, a true hibernator. Um, the Arctic ground squirrel is one of the champion uh, hibernators. 
Um, they can stay underground for a long time, depending on you know where they're at. Um, their core body temperature may drop below zero degrees Celsius, which is the freezing point, and can grow as you know can dip as low as two point nine degrees Celsius. Uh, their heartbeat slows from a hundred beats per minute to fifteen beats per minute. It's very similar to the woodchuck. Uh, just like the woodchuck, they can lose twenty three seven percent of their body weight. They can lose a lot of body weight over the winter. Um, and they have done experiments to test those numbers to make sure. Uh, and they have tested the the, the different temperatures around a, a hibernating uh, Arctic ground squirrel, which is just fascinating. But they can, your body temperature temperature can drop quite a bit. Um, and I, I don't know this for a fact, but my guess is there's probably some uh, physiological changes that happen in there where certain tissues um, get the accumulation of sugars or other um, uh, chemicals that are less, uh, that have a much lower freezing point than water. And that's what helps prevent the, the tissues of this uh, mammal from freezing. Uh, even though its body temperature drops so significantly low, it's much much lower than the woodchuck. It's it's incredible that they can um, have that kind of a body temperature drop and then still come back from it uh, at the end of the uh, hibernation. Uh, so before I oh I put them in the wrong spot. Um, speaking of mammals. I don't know if I put them in the wrong spot, but I would have liked them somewhere else. These are fat-tailed dwarf lemurs, uh, and the next one I'll show you is a type of hedgehog. And I often read, when I read about these, um, God, I think that's why I put them in the segment here. Sorry about that. Um, they often talk about them hibernating during the dry season, um, but there's not necessarily a body temperature drop, although there is a fluctuation for the for the dwarf lemurs, which is kind of interesting. Um, but they are reacting to a, um, a dry season. Um, and there's another type of dormancy I'm going to talk about um, in, in a bit here, and, and I'll remind you that that's what that is. And I think that's more accurate than, than hibernation. Uh, but again, I, I see that term hibernation just thrown about you know, the minute something is inactive for a certain period of time they're hibernating and again it really does refer to endotherms um, that have a, a serious body temperature drop that would otherwise be completely unhealthy or even fatal um, but both the fat-tailed dwarf lemur which is your, something you'd find on Madagascar uh, and the four-toed hedgehog which you can see here is, is found across the, the midsection of Africa in savanna habitats which is partly why um, you know, it's also reacting to dry conditions when it goes through that that period of dormancy um, that they both um, you'll find that they both have that because Madagascar can have dry, you know, dry periods and so can um, the savanna areas of Africa. We'll come back to that in a second. When you're talking about reptiles, when you're talking about amphibians, um, finding a, a place to shelter them from the severe cold, to shelter them from freezing, um, that is brumation. Uh, and that is what ectotherms do to sur to survive. This is their inactive period, their dormancy. Their version of hibernation is called brumation. You can see you got a box turtle like, uh, on the, in the middle there and a worm snake on the right and a fence lizard on the left. Um, and turtles will experience this as well. Different turtles experience it in different ways. Um, on the left is a common snapping turtle. Uh, it, along with several many other types of aquatic turtles, will often go into the mud at the bottom of lakes, uh, you know, rivers, uh, ponds, marshes, and wetlands bury into the mud, and that's where they'll stay. The advantage of that, as I mentioned earlier, is that water is more thermally stable, and so you don't have as as um, wicked a, a a temperature fluctuation. Um, so the good news is the temperature doesn't change that often. The bad news is the temperature doesn't change that often. So if it's cold, it's going to stay colder in that water a lot longer because it takes the water longer to heat up. Um, but, uh, snapping turtles are very good at um, collecting the radiation they need from the sun, even underwater. They tend not to bask very often. And so it's great for them to... Um, you know, it would be easier for them to warm up. There are occasions where I have been out and seen turtles moving under the ice, which I think is fascinating. One adaptation they have that really helps them out is their cloaca, their urogenital opening, uh, and the lining of their mouth have very thin tissues, and so oxygen can pass across those membranes. Uh, there also can be some oxygen 
um, absorption, even through, I think, directly through the skin. And because the turtle is in a very cold environment, um, its metabolism drops quite a bit. And so their oxygen need is much lower because there's so much less activity going on in their body that they can survive on what little oxygen goes across the membranes of the mouth and the um, the cloaca and even the, the rest of their, their skin there. Um, sea turtles can also use that cloacal opening to maximize their uh, diving ability by using it to also get some extra oxygen from the seawater as well. Uh, box turtles can't swim. Uh, so they need that both of their front legs oftentimes uh, to dig and uh, dig in and and um, get out of the cold weather for the winter. Oftentimes you'll see box turtles like we have one that's missing a, a front leg. Um, these stumpy uh, is also missing one at long branch. Those box turtles, if you release them, they're not going to probably not going to survive the winter because they only have one leg instead of two and they wouldn't be able to dig in and get themselves uh, into a safe place for winter to brewmate. Um, box turtles can also survive being submerged for short periods of time, um, which is a relative term. Um, I can't survive being submerged for two to three hours, but box turtles during the uh, the spring when you know they're still pretty cold, their body their metabolism is still pretty low, can survive a certain amount of submersion from um, floods that are caused by you know spring rains or winter thaws. Um, but you can't put a box turtle in water. They can't swim and they will drown if the water's over their head. Uh, they, they can go in a little bit of water and they do like that, but they can't swim. But they can sub survive sub being submerged briefly um, when their metabolism is still really low uh, in the in the spring months. Uh, estivation. This is what um, I think is is the best description for the lemur and the hedgehog we talked about earlier. Estivation is a period of dormancy that typically happens uh, when temperatures are warm and conditions are arid. Um, around here, the, the best example we have of that is the uh, eastern redback salamander. These are some little salamanders you'll find in the woods. They're probably the most common salamander and might even be one of the most common vertebrates uh, in our woods, but they hide under rocks and logs and leaves and you don't see them very often. <clears throat> uh, and even though they're called the rest red back salamander, there are also color morphs that are yellowish tan on the back or completely dark that are called lead backs. Um, those are like the three different color morphs you'll see is the red, the yellow and the black. Um, but they go through periods of estivation during the summer when it is hot and dry. So they're really common in the spring and in the fall uh, is really the best time to, to go turn over things to find them. Um, there are, are mollusks, which will do the same thing. Some terrestrial mollusks will uh, react to uh, warm and dry conditions by climbing up uh, vegetation, or in this case, human structures, uh, and then sealing themselves up to wait out the dry period. Uh, this is an, a non-native snail in uh, a part of southern uh, Australia. I think it's in the genus Thebes, T-H-E-B-E-S or A-S. Um, and it's a non-native, I can't I don't remember if it's called invasive. There are agriculture, agricultural um, uh, let me try that again. There are farmers, I talked to myself in a corner. There are farmers who um, will consider them very invasive or at least very damaging uh, because they will crawl up crops and do that, or they can crawl up uh, structures uh, and get themselves in the way. Uh, but it's a really fascinating kind of um, uh, adaptation because they crawl up these spaces and they will seal off their operculum. They sometimes de develop a um, a different structure. They'll develop a different structure to go through this and it's to help essentially reduce or eliminate uh, moisture loss during the dry period. Uh, and they will spend the dry period in these phases. It seems very exposed. Um, I have I and I'm not sure why they go up high unless maybe they're trying to avoid the eventual uh, rain or deluge of the wet season, um, but they do climb up to um, whatever kind of structure they can find, which typically is vegetation, but may also be um, obviously human made structures like these fence posts. Um, diapause, this is uh, bring this a little bit back home here. Diapause is essentially a cessation of development or a pause in development until conditions become better. For us, this is most common with our insects and arthropods and, and invertebrates, where they might go through diapause to survive the winter, which is typically the around here for a lot of our invertebrates and a lot of our insects, the, the worst, worst season 
or the season with the uh, worst conditions for them. This is a um, bald faced hornet uh, and probably a queen. She was in a log and I un un uh, covered her uh, and quickly covered her back up and hope she was doing OK. Um, uh, late, you know, late winter, early spring it was either late February, early March when I found her. Um, and so she was in this she had crawled in this log and was hanging out in there hoping to make it through the winter um, before they regenerate for some uh, for many organisms. This is um, this is typical of a, you know, a butterfly life cycle for many organisms. This happens in a specific or they time their life cycle. So it happens during a specific stage. Uh, in this case, you've got the typical butterfly, you know, um, Life cycle. So you got the egg here in the upper left. That's a swallowtail egg. You get the swallowtail caterpillars, the chrysalis, and obviously the adult swallowtail, which will lay more eggs. And so you've got your little your little life cycle or circle. Um, for most species like this, one of those stages. It's not like somebody gets surprised and they just have to tough it out for winter. They time their life cycle so that one of these specific stages is the one that overwinters, whether it be the egg stage, the larva, the pupa or the adult. Um, I think it just had a squirrel went across the roof. Um, in other insects, this is, uh, I believe this is holometabolism. Um, in hemimetabolism, there's only three stages. There's the egg, the nymph, and the adult. And that's the, and it's the same deal with them. It's either the egg, the nymph, or the adult that is the stage that overwinters. So it's pretty regular. Um, one of the most famous, um, I think, uh, insects that we think about that that relates to this is the woolly bear or the woolly worm, depending on where you're from. Um, this is the larva of the Isabella tiger moth. The woolly bear tends to uh, be seen a lot in the fall. They've eaten their fill. They're moving around trying to find a place to pupate to get through the winter. Many um, species that overwinter as a pupa need to feel that temperature change or even a freeze need to have that stimulus from the environment before they can trigger uh, the change or the metamorphosis into an adult. Uh, and so if they don't get that freeze, if it's a, it tends to be a really mild winter or their their little microclimate where they're at doesn't have a freeze, that may uh, impair or completely retard their development. They don't have the ability to grow from it. Um, or to metamorphose from it. So for some of these critters, that freeze is actually very, very important. Um, most people think of the woolly bear as a prognosticator, uh, and no, I don't think it's a prognosticator. If anything, the uh, the bands uh, and the length or width of the brown band versus the black bands is actually a really good indicator of what happened to uh, the previous winter uh, and it's a reaction to that but not necessarily a predictor of what's about to happen uh, to the upcoming winter uh, as well um, and then uh, some of our earliest butterflies that you'll see on the left is a question mark on the right is a morning cloak um, these are two butterflies that you often see early early in spring sometimes even late winter on more really warm days and they are um, Butterflies that overwinter as adults. They find a place to hide in rocks, crevices, cracks, underneath tree bark, you know, where, wherever little space they can find. Uh, and so they're one of the first adult butterflies you see that comes out um, in the spring because they overwinter as an adult. Um, so there are different critters. Like I said, these it's insects and these arthropods do all have kind of a different life stage. This is essentially when they overwinter. Um, so a lot of my ideas for um my winter programs come from this winter world book on the left by Bern Heinrich I can't recommend it enough it's a fantastic book he's a really interesting mind he writes about it from um his home in Maine so it's a little colder and a little more wintry uh the background that he's writing about but there's still a lot of fascinating uh ideas in there uh and the Stokes Guide to Nature in Winter is always a good read and it's always a lot of interesting ideas and facts that you can go right out and translate into what you're seeing in the winter uh in our forest as well um so uh thank you all for joining me I'm going to uh unshare my screen now uh and get out of my presentation and uh check the chat but if anybody has any questions uh, that they would like to ask me about that would be that would be a really good time to do that. Hi Ken. Hey Melanie. 
right. I just, I am curious what you said about the dwarf lemurs in mm -hmm. Madagascar. I'm yep. almost certain that we, we saw them uh, in uh, the dry forest. It's called Ancarafansica on the west coast, but okay. I'm not sure because there's the wet forest on the east coast and mm -hmm. the dry forest on the west. And okay. you can only visit the dry forest during the dry season. And so we saw these tiny little lemurs um, mm -hmm. all at night, all the time while we were hiking up to our research post, you know. Okay. But well, I don't. But I'm not sure that they were dwarf lemurs. But they were. Yeah. <laughs> we, we had the head, headlamps, and the headlamps would show and reflect off their retina, so you'd see the the big right. round ones, big round eyes, and then medium, and then tiny eyes looking at us. <laughs> yeah. Because um, there's no lights in the forest, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, and I think these are. Um, I think they might be more of a. Uh, uh, I'm trying to remember the terms I use now. Um, I think it might be more of a consequential. Uh, estivation than a predictive. I don't know that they always do it. Oh, if it um, goes it might be more. It, yeah, it might be more of a reaction to specifically uh, dry time. Um, yeah. So if it's not too dry, they might they might not go through it at all. But um, yeah, and it, it is interesting. Like I said, I was reading uh, an article about them online, and they kept they went between hibernation and estivation, and then through in torpor. So they were like using all the terms, um, but really. Um, I think the appropriate term when you're talking about a warm period that is also dry, estivation is the right term for that. It was one thing we learned, so. though, about Madagascar is that mm -hmm. there is a lot of information about the natural world there mm -hmm. that is not correct. There's whole books published that are totally wrong. Mm -hmm. and, you can do and, that, but yeah, you can yeah, do that on the internet. And, like I said, I was finding yeah. all kinds of information on chipmunks, and I ended up in this whole uh, rabbit hole trying to get this one answer. Uh, right. And then when I went back in here to be like, all right, I'm going to put it in this way. I realized I hadn't initially included it in this program because it was such a question mark. And so um, and a lot of times. Finding the right information, especially if you do an Internet search versus books is you'll find it written exactly the same way in some places, just cut and paste, especially out of Wikipedia. And so they're just repeating that. And that's the the depth as they find one source. And so for some of these some of these pieces of information i try to find a second source to make sure i've got the right information if it's really fantastic i want to do that um yeah and with like i said with the chipmunk um i just i just did a simple question search on google and i'm looking at all the little snippets from all these websites and there was like three that were like yes they're hibernators and two that were like no they're not hibernators and then one that's there are hibernators and three more that they aren't so yeah, yeah. The, um, the, I've got a book the, I want to check, but it's at the office, and I wasn't the, able to check it tonight. So the the Duke Center for Lemur Research is, I think, it's the Nicholson uh, Institute. That is that had uh, Lawrence Durrell. He was there. You know, he's the guy who saved the radiated turtles. And okay, we we saw his turtle farm there in in Ankara Fonseca, and 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 um, but they they're pretty much a very good source for lemur um, information, but also for Cryptoproctopherox, you know the the fusa that hunt the lemurs. They're gotcha. they're like a they were often they were called a cat, and they're not a cat, and they're not a dog. They're in their own family, mm -hmm. and it was yep. uh, Janet Ewer from Britain who uh, her works are in the Library of Congress. Uh, you can dig them up. She's the one that figured it out. You know, it's like, but for a long time, there's all this wrong information out there. So, because yeah. they look like a puma, actually, but they're oh, yeah. not. Yeah, they're cool. Yeah, just, all those weird. I think that that would be a cool deep dive is to find out wrong information. Oh, about oh. Wild, about animals. You know, you could do that. Yeah, like well, birds thank you. hibernating. Good, yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. And they, like I said, this is one, and then there's another one with poisonous versus venomous. I find that I have a little passion for getting the right words out for getting the right words in everybody's mouth so they can they have the right vocabulary for it. So. Yeah. 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 Thanks, okay. Emily. Thanks, Melanie. Thanks, thanks so much. Yeah, I loved course. your talk. It was great. <clears throat> sure, sure. Uh, what should we do if we come across a hibernating groundhog? If you, uh, Emma, that's a great question. If you can leave it alone, leave it alone. You know, if you don't have to move it, especially any other critter, because um, you could disturb it. Uh, but also, if you, um, um, you could change its conditions. You know, it. What I always tell people is I'm not a, a wildlife rehabber. So if you if you come across a critter that is hibernating and you don't know um, what to do with it, if you can't leave it where you found it, there's always I would always recommend the Wildlife Rescue League as a um, uh, thank you. 
I appreciate that. Whatever. I love the, the screen name. Um, I would always say try the Wildlife Rescue League uh, and see if they have a, a good idea for it. I, I really don't know. Uh, and I've never had that. Uh, they The animals that are true migrate or uh, hibernators tend to be really good at concealing themselves or or choosing a good spot. But if you do run across, come across one, uh, an animal that is hibernating um, for whatever reason, that's definitely a question, probably more for a wildlife rehabilitator than for me. Uh, and I see you're still typing there, Emma. So I'm going to say, oh, yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, I've never, uh, like I said, I'm not sure what to do with that. But whenever you find a critter that looks like it could be very vulnerable or uh, really um, affected in a negative way by moving it, if whenever the, you can leave it, that's always uh, my first recommendation. So uh, it's 8.02, exactly uh, an hour after I started. Does, are there any other questions? For me. Oh, you guys, whenever you don't have questions, it makes me feel so good, like I did a good job. Uh, well, thank you all. Uh, I appreciate this. E appreciate you coming and joining me this evening. Uh, I'm going to sign off here in a minute unless somebody jumps in with a question at the last uh, second. Otherwise, everybody have a great evening and thank you. Great presentation. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Gary. Appreciate it. Good night, everybody.